Good morning, everyone. Um, I welcome you to the seminar hosted by the ISS today. My name is Lizette Lancaster. I am the manager of the Crime and Justice Information Hub at the ISS's Crime and Justice, uh, Crime and Violence Prevention Program. I will be the moderator of today's webinar titled, What Priorities Should South Africa's Next Police Minister Have? As the resourcing and performance of the SAPs have deter um, has deteriorated since 2012, rates of murder and violent organized crime have soared. This seminar see, um, looks at what can be done to um, and what should our police minister be focusing on. This seminar is also part of our Driving Justice series which aims at transforming systems and empowering communities. We greatly appreciate the support of the Hans Seidel Foundation. The ISS is also grateful for the support of the members of the ISS Partnership Forum, which includes the Hans Seidel Foundation, the European Union, the Open Societies Foundations, and the governments of Denmark, Ireland, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. Um, to provide insights into the topic, I'm pleased to introduce and kick off this discussion with our speakers. But before I do that, we will, um, we will ask you to please keep your um, cameras off and your, um, your, yourself muted. We will, after some time, um, we're in discussions with the speakers, we'll open the floor for um, questions and comments through the hand raise, the raised hand function or the chat function. Remember, Chatham House rules do not apply as this event is broadcast on Facebook and YouTube. So please do not mention anything you do not feel comfortable with making it into the public domain or media. So as ISS is working toward contributing to a stable and peaceful Africa characterized by sustainable development, human rights and the rule of law, democracy and collaborative security. We also focus on the work in South Africa on enhancing criminal justice and the rule of law. Um, our program, the Justice and Violence Prevention Program and the crimehub.org website aim to provide accessible, accurate and reliable information and analysis on violence and especially um, violence in our public spaces. We hope that information is used by role players to support problem solving and to help prevent any forms of violence. So with that in mind, when we frame and, and decided to have this meeting, um, the great consideration was that after the elections on 29 May, um, the new, the seventh administration will and the president will have to select a police minister and that will be one of the most important decisions that the president can make given the crime and violence um, that crime and violence is one of the greatest issues that south africans use to vote or to cast votes on to make their decisions so what quality should the minister have and what must he or she do to reverse the deterioration in policing and public safety. So with no further holdups or, or delays, I'm going to introduce our esteemed speakers and panelists. Our first panelist is Professor Irvin Kins um, from the Center of Criminology at uh, uh, the University of Cape Town and a former content advisor to the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Police. Our second panelist is Alvin Rapia. At the moment, the partner at the Regenesis Business School is a business consultant and executive coach and former secretary um, of the Secretariat, uh, Civilian Secretariat for Police Service. And our third panelist is Gareth Newham, the head of the Justice and Violence Prevention Program at the Institute for Security Studies. He, like our other panelists, been serving the country for decades, continuing efforts to strengthen our ability to deal with our complex, organized crime and violence challenges. So welcome all the panelists. Um, let's start by 
just um, looking at the role of the police minister. Irvin, I'm going to put you on the hot seat first. What does the constitution say is the role of the minister of police? Thank you, Lizette. Uh, the constitution is very clear on the role of the minister of police. The minister is responsible for making national policing policy. And he has to make that policy after consultation with provincial governments and taking into account the provincial uh, needs and priorities when it comes to, to policing. So the constitution is very, very, very clear. Um, and there could be a set of different policies around policing, uh, but it has to take into account those uh, priorities and needs of those particular provinces. Thanks. And um, Alvin, now, you know, quite a complex question, I think, but without naming necessarily particular ministers, how have different ministers interpreted this role in your experience? Thank you, um, Lizette. I, I, I think um, the, the police, it's a very huge um, uh, system and it can be very overwhelming. But uh, when you enter that space, um, you get absorbed by the, the, the police with their resources. And in some cases, you find that um, the minister will get into this role and be received by the police instead of being received by the uh, civilian secretariat, which is responsible to, to develop policies for the minister, assist the minister in making sure that um, uh, uh, the police are playing their role effectively. And in some cases, you find that instead of the minister coming in to deal with policies, they already would have got um, um, fed with different information from um, uh, the, the police to an extent that uh, the role of the civilian secretariat end up being submued and it doesn't give um, uh, the minister the strategic advice up uh, responsibility that that it has. Um, after 1994, the first five years, uh, because of the role that the civilian secretariat was um, uh, uh, playing in that first part, it was very strong. The it was called the the Department of Safety and Security, which made the minister to focus on the, of the, 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 the oversight role and making sure that the doctrine of the police is properly uh, defined. But I think the wheels came off when the secretariat was uh, dissolved and put under the uh, commission of police. That was... Um, um, I think around 2000, um, uh, 2003, around that uh, that time, that was uh, the time of uh, um, Commissioner Jackie Silib. And that made now the role of the minister to become bled. Uh, in some cases, you find that the police are now determining policy, which is supposed to be determined by the, the minister. Thanks. Thanks. I think you are raising really important um, points, and thanks for 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 also taking us back to the history of this. Um, Gareth, can I ask you to come in here? Um, in your experience, um, you know, having uh, done research on policing and often with the police for over what shall we say it over thirty years. Um, we have landed here, but what should the minister do? I mean, Irvin has spoken about the constitution. What should the role of the minister be? Thanks, Lizette. Um, our constitution is quite, or gives the minister quite a constrained, unconstrained power. It sort of says the minister must give directives to the police. Um, and it doesn't say much more than that other than the policy role that uh, Irvin mentioned. 
But this is a challenge that faces countries around the world, particularly democracies, because most of the time you'll have some a politician who becomes a minister, a, a governing party gets into power. The person they appoint to be responsible for policing, um, in our case, is a dedicated police minister. In fact, the only minister mentioned in the constitution, I think, is the minister of police. None of the other minister portfolios are actually mentioned. Uh, but in many other countries, you'd have the minister of the interior or another minister, and the police would be one department that falls under them. And because more often than not, ministers are not trained, experienced police officials, their role should be one of executive oversight. In other words, they're there to provide the strategies and policies for the police. So the new government or the government comes in and says, okay, we really want to reduce murder. We want to make sure that we take firearm violence very seriously. That's the goal. We That's the, the strategic direction we want to focus on. Um, and our policies will look at how to support you. But it's up to the police to put the operational plans in place to achieve those of, of strategic objectives. And executive oversight means that the minister doesn't get involved in the operation side of things, nor does the minister get involved in the appointments of senior staff and that kind of thing, because that's entering into the fray. So the minister should stand above the police, um, obviously be supportive, be a public communicator to explain to the public what the police are trying to achieve, some of the challenges that they might be facing and how they are addressing these challenges, but really let the operational experts in the police, who hopefully are operational experts, who've been there in the organization, understand the nature of the challenges they're facing, the organizational challenges. They present a plan to the minister, and then the minister uses um, her or his capability. In South Africa, the, the role is the civilian secretariat to really assess the implementation of the, the plans to de deal with these strategic objectives. And that way, the minister um, remains objective, is not invested in a particular kind of operation, isn't necessarily supporting specific uh, senior commanders of others, but really looking at the organizational performance um, with an eye on, is this organization improving its performance and its capabilities? Is it improving its efficiencies, its use of resources? Are we seeing impact on public safety overall? Because remember, we're talking about a very large organization, over 180,000 personnel working from 1,150 plus police stations. Um, so you can't get into the details of all of that operational planning and all the people involved. But you do have to make sure that you have hard evidence before you that tells you on a regular basis what is working, what is not working, so that you can use your considerable political clout in order to make sure that if additional resources are needed, if external partners are needed, that you bring in that cap capability available to you to help get the organization to perform as well as is possible. Um, so that's what, what we the, the term executive oversight means. It's not getting involved in operations, but it's being able to really give direction and hold the police management accountable for achieving those objectives through the proper implementation of operational plans. Thanks, Gareth. Um, Evan, I'm sure you have some issues to add, and I'm just thinking, without naming names, do you have examples of where police ministers have overstepped their authority and interfered in operational matters, as, as pointed out by, um, by Gareth? Um, and if so, what do you think the consequences of this have been for the SAPs? Lizette, I just want to latch on to something that Gareth yeah. has said before Please. I answer that question. I think there were good reasons um, for the drafters of the Constitution uh, allocating those particular powers in Section 2061 and 2 to the Minister of Police. Because uh, flowing from an apartheid government, uh, the principle was that we, we required civilian control and oversight over the police. If the police, as Mr. Rapier has suggested here, uh, becomes involved in policy and policy making, then we have a problem. We should keep the police out of policy making. It's not their responsibility to make policy. And um, when, uh, so in a democratic society, the, the idea of civilian oversight and control of um, uh, an institution such as SAPS um, which have now gone back to its, its, its military um, mentality and approach with its ranks and so forth, despite the National Development Plan uh, suggesting that the police should demilitarize. 
Uh, I think it's important that we hold uh, that particular principle quite strong, that civilian oversight and control over the police. And that is why we have um, institutions such as parliament and the media and so forth and so on uh, playing a role and, 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 and um, the civil society organizations playing, playing a role. Examples of where the police ministers in the past have become involved in operational affairs was um, when, I mean, shortly after, uh, I think the second or third minister, or the second minister of police um, took control after the, the second administration, uh, suggested uh, that um, the uh, criminals should be dealt with harshly. We had the deputy minister uh, and the third uh, administration saying we should shoot the incorrigible bastards. Uh, we had uh, ministers uh, urging the police to take a hard stance of taking the gloves off, squeeze the balls of, of, the, of these criminals. And that um, exhortation on the part of the police ministers um, shouldn't be their role. It should be the role of the National Commissioner to protect the institution and the members of the police institution um, and guide them in the correct ways that the Constitution has originally envisaged. Taking the gloves uh, off is one thing, but making sure that the police uh, fight crime and protect the public, um, and one can look at the, the way that police have um, uh, police uh, public order demonstrations. The overwhelming majority of these demonstrations have been uh, peaceful. And uh, more lately, the police have become involved in fighting with some of the, the demonstrators. So I think our police ministers should not become involved in issuing instructions of that particular nature. Um, so yeah, let me leave it at that. Thanks. No, I think you're making important points. And and Gareth, um, do you think that the current ministerial regulations published in 2018 that allow for the minister to influence the appointment, for instance, um, of other decisions relating to the placement of senior commanders and so on, has a role in what Irvin has been describing? Yeah, I mean, these, these uh, the latest version of the ministerial regulations are from 2018, and they updated the 2016 version. And when it comes to appointments and promotions, they do provide a role. They say that the minister must, uh, these appointments must take place in consultation with the minister, and the minister can appoint the chairpersons of panels, um, any kind of movement transfers, uh, the minister has to agree to. And the minister also every three years needs to set up a panel um, to look at the working conditions of the senior management structure of the South African Police Service. Um, that, you know, is, is you can understand on one hand, the minister might be interested in these matters, um, but it does open the door for potentially too much interference. As I said, mentioned earlier, the minister should be really concerned that the best possible men and women are appointed to posts and that the process for achieving that is competitive, merit-based, transparent, um, and fair. Um, and that's where they should really leave it. They shouldn't get involved necessarily in wanting particular people in particular posts, because then they obviously immediately have a vested interest in that person. It's much more difficult to hold somebody accountable if you personally wanted them to be in a particular position, and now they're not performing their role as well as you might have thought they could, um, but you have had played a role in getting them into that position, immediately makes it difficult to hold them accountable effectively. So from my perspective, I think um, it would be better if we really, you know, made sure that the, the appointment process is as rigorous, um, used some of the most recent methods for assessing people's integrity, ability to be innovative thinkers, solve complex problems, the range of human resource related techniques to do this. Um, so the minister should be making sure that those best possible methodologies are brought to bear to ensure that we have the most strongest uh, women and men in, you know, people the best place to do this mm. kind of work, and then um, hold, the, hold them accountable for achieving improvements in policing. Um, so I think there's a role to be played there where we could look at the ministerial regulations um, and see how, and if there's going to be amendments to the Act, um, the SAPS Act in the future, we could also look at how do you also 
prevent that and there are various ways um you know because for example if the minister is going to give directives to the police ideally these are in writing and these are made public uh, and that could be through parliament um so that any political office bearer who wants to give any instruction to a police official that will affect the operational duties that has to be made in writing and has to be made public at some point through a process ideally through parliament um just to ensure that the directives that are being given are lawful in line with strategies and the constitution and that you don't have a situation um, where, minister, where ministers might start um, overstepping the boundaries getting involved too much in operational details about who must be arrested who mustn't be and that kind of thing um, so there's a variety of ways in which our legal and ministerial regulatory framework could be strengthened um, to minimize that kind of risk thanks um alvin i'm going to ask you if you have any additions or thoughts to what um, Irvin and, and Gareth has been, the examples they've given and the solutions they have proposed? What would your message be in terms of operational matters and interference for the next administration? Let me just start by that those um, uh, regulations of uh, uh, 2018. And just to give some context in terms of that, um, the, 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 the issue that uh, was complicated this thing is the police is listed as a department in the Public Service Act in the schedule, which was not supposed to be the case. It's supposed to be a service, an agency outside, but immediately you put it under the Public Service um, uh, Act. There must be alignment in terms of what is happening in the public service. And those um, uh, regulations, um, as they were being drawn, um, the, 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 the Department of Public Service was involved in terms of how things should happen. The department that must be listed in the in the the public service um, act should be the civilian secretary. That should be the one that becomes uh, the the uh, uh, the department. So the police should be like the South African National uh, Defence Force, and you will have the Department of Defence being the secretary of defence. Mm -hmm. The, the, the um, chief of the defense force, it's not uh, uh, um, treated as a director general. But in the case of the national commissioner, because he is heading a department, he's treated as such. And that distinction should be there. And, and I think uh, going forward, we have to go back to where it was. Um, in 1994, it was not listed in the in the in the Public Service um, Act. It was a police service, and the National Commissioner was um, uh, responsible. And when it comes to the conditions of service, the Minister of Police will go and determine conditions of service. So it starts with the Minister of Public Service and Administration. There will be negotiation. They determine the conditions of service. And she will write, or he or she will write to the Minister of Police and say, I've determined this, the following conditions of service. You can apply them in your environment. And then the minister makes um, agree and say, we are taking this, but for the police, maybe add uh, certain things. So for me, to avoid this uh, confusion and give the National Commissioner, the powers and the responsibility to control and manage the police as per the, the, the Constitution. This issue needs to be um, uh, reversed. Thank and you. I'm, I'm also hearing uh, rumors, and these are uh, 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 rumors, and I hope it's not true, that there is um, uh, a move from certain quarters that who want to push that uh, the civilian secretariat goes back and be put into um, uh, under the police. And for me, that is going to be 
taking away even the powers that the minister has in terms of defining the doctrine of uh, uh, the, the police, using independent resources that um, uh, he has in his uh, disposal. And for me, it will be a contravention of the, the constitution. Thanks. Thanks, Alvin. Yes, um, Irvin, I was about to ask that you come in there. I'm sure this is, um, you would like to respond. Yes, I, I think I, I agree with um, uh, with what uh, Alvin is, is saying. And I, I think one must be careful here because if you look at section section 74 of that those employment regulations, uh, it allows the minister to deploy uh, SMS members, senior management service members from one unit to another unit and uh, take them out of particular units. It also says that the minister is responsible for the budget of the police. It cannot be. The Public Service Act makes the accounting officer the National Commission of Police. And so it is the determination of the National Commission. The budget must be within his preserve uh, and not that of, of, of the minister. And, and granted, even what Alvin is saying there, there are civilian members uh, in, in SAPS and there are um, uh, police officers, uh, operational police officers, uh, SAPS Act members. And so there is a, a distinction between some of the, the members in SAPS, but I, I think certainly those are some of the issues that uh, a new minister has to address. But the, the question of the, uh, as the, these uh, regulations um, say, it gives the minister much more powers than the principal act. And that is why it's necessary to review the South African Police Service Act, and quite urgently, I know Parliament has, has placed it as a priority piece of legislation on the agenda. And I think Parliament must must draft its own SAPS Act, because SAPS is just not bringing that act to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and and you know this the act will probably be an issue for the new Parliament, um, but in the meantime, we've got an election coming. Um, and and for ordinary citizens, the question is what what will um, a new what should we expect from a new police minister or uh, the current one who ever serves the the seventh administration, given that we have these very high crime rates, for example. You know, we saw a decrease in the murder rate in the first 18 years of democracy by 55%, but now we're already seeing it climbing again by 52%, you know, so clawing its way back. Um, or admittedly from a lower base, so we're not there yet where we were in 94, but, but we are getting there steadily. We are having this, you know, gender-based violence remains a problem. We've seen a growth in organized crime, um, and we have, and and other organizations like the Global Initiative Against um, Against Transnational Crime, our own ENAC pro program, have been talking about this basically existential threat to South Africa's democracy. So, Irvin, just to 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 throw things around a bit, do you have any thoughts as to why? This has been the case. Before we get to what we expect a new administration and a new minister, what they could do about this, but of course you can talk about that too. You know, it, it, I, I think we at a very, very scary moment in our country's history when it comes to policing. I want to take you back to 1993. Uh, I want to suggest that there was a moment in 1993 with the Transitional Executive Council and the National Peacekeeping Force where nobody was really in control of what the police were doing and what uh, members of the public, I call it dual power. The ANC at the time were, were too weak to, to take power uh, in its own name and the old National Party government was too weak to hold on to power in its own name and the police were caught in the middle. And remember that police took instructions from a national police minister to bomb Kotso House, to, to, to do blatantly crim, criminal um, things. 
And um, if we look at where we are now, we see the growth of vigilante organizations, we see the growth of organized crime, and we see communities mobilizing in their own name. A new minister must take the goodwill on the part of the community. He must, he must take hands. This was only done in 1994 when there was that extensive consultation, 1995, with communities around the country to develop that national crime prevention strategy. And I think that was a fantastic moment in our country's history where the minister played the role of helping communities shape a policy for policing for the future. And, and in this case, I think our minister must go back to the drawing board or a new minister must go back to the drawing board and reconsult with our community structures and bring them in and bring civil society into the thinking process of what um, um, a reject South African police service means to people on the, on the streets. Because at the end of the day, the basic crime fighting unit is the police station. And our police stations are a problem. They're turning people away in some cases um, because of language problems. Uh, and people leave police stations dissatisfied. And so a new minister must take in hand the goodwill that the public is showing uh, and wanting to work with the police uh, to turn around what it means for uh, professional policing in the country and better service delivery. So I, I want to leave it. I think the other panelists can add. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, let's, um, before I get to Alvin, Gareth, I'm sure you've got some thoughts on how a police minister could change the situation. Thanks, Azette. Yeah, look, um, we must also be aware, and I think Alvin, uh, and Irvin was ex ex pointing to this, it's not something that one person can fix, and it's not something only the police can fix. So it is important that you have partnerships and you open up the space for different ways of dealing with this. I think that's kind of the challenge you face is that um, the drivers of crime, you know, low economic, economic growth, high levels of unemployment, high levels of inequality, access to firearms, excessive drinking, access to drugs. Um, those are the kind of push factors that, that contribute to our high crime rate. Um, and they are complex. And if you look at our violence prevention work, which we've done a lot of work on um, for since about before 2015, there are various things that can be done before you even get to the criminal justice system and can, that can mitigate that. So that's a whole different topic. But it does point to the fact that, for example, when our crime statistics are released, ideally, it's not the police minister releasing the crime statistics. It should be Statistics South Africa releasing the crime statistics, and then all the ministers should be sitting there, or at least most of the ministers, and saying, what is their department doing to provide good early childhood development, provide really quality basic education, make sure schools are environments of learning and safety? How do we deal with keeping the young, young people, young adults occupied? And what are the options that the government's providing for them. I mean, there are many things happening. So it's not that you'd have to come up with brand new approaches. In many ways, it would just signal that crime is a consequence of a whole range of challenges our society faces, historical challenges and current challenges. Um, and that we can't expect one agency, one organization called the South African Police Service, um, which will never have enough resources. We're never going to get enough police officers to have a bobby on the beat on every corner and to deal with the kinds of challenges that a population of over 62 million people present. So, you know, first of all, I think that's something that the new minister could do is just shift the discussion and say, look, it's not only policing, but not in a way that tries to shift blame or defensiveness for uh, the police not doing it as well as they could do, but just pointing out that it is a much more complex situation and we need to get as many role players on board as possible in as practical ways as possible. So not just saying words like whole of society or whole of government, but really, you know, what can each department really do and, and, and understand what that what they do does have an impact and how. Um, and then of course, it's about really bringing in new thinking. Um, I think the challenge with the National Police Service, you know, it's a large organization all the standards, regulations, and everything are set in Pretoria. But we're talking about police officers who are confronted with an incredibly large variety of situations in different contexts every day. What's happening in the middle of Cape Town is very different to what's happening in the far rural areas of KwaZulu-Natal. 
what's happening in you know in 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 um, Hillbrow is going to be very different to what's happening in Limpopo. So you you need to be able to start thinking about policing as something, as Irvin said, that takes place at a local level, and that needs to be able to respond to what's happening at that local level. And you don't know what's happening there unless you really invest in your your intelligence and analytical capabilities. So that you really bolster this. I mean, I, th I think we we have this idea, and this is something that's been a long-standing approach in South African policing, is that we need high visibility. That means lots of boots on the ground, and if we can get that right, we'll be fine. But actually, you're never going to have enough boots on the ground. So then the next only option you have is highly strategic targeted policing action. Um, so last year we had 27 and a half thousand murders. We don't have, we're not going to arrest 27 and a half thousand murderers. But if we were able to build our capacity to identify who are the top 5,000 repeat violent offenders who are causing a lot of this harm, um, and then direct resources we have, and try different things in different places. Um, you know, I think we can't just have one operation that covers the entire country and everybody's doing the same thing in different places. Um, you really need to be innovative. You need to bring in new thinking. You need to have new operational styles. Look internationally at what different countries, those that are similar to ourselves, such as in Brazil, um, Colombia, South America, and other parts of Africa even, how are they dealing with policing informal settlements? Um, how are they policing organized crime? There might be lessons we can share. So really open up that space for doing things differently. And that's the big role. I think the, the single thing that the new minister can come in or the next minister can do is just shift that thinking, open up the thinking, allow more innovative uh, ideas and operations to take place and really make crime a lot more um, of a partnership between the police and many other organizations. So that's that's one thing I think that could make a big difference. Thanks, Gareth. Yes, so online, um, we have some comments on this. Um, supporting the idea, um, Barbara Holtman is saying, yes, Gareth, wouldn't it be great to have transversal systematic leads um, from ministers on safety? So supporting the idea of a multi- a departmental approach to the crime statistics. Um, we are getting some questions on, so we'll get to those in about the next 10 minutes, but I just want to um, circle back to Alvin. Um, you've been hearing um, these suggestions by Irvin and Gareth, and, and, and I would love to hear from you about what you believe, what would you advise the, the, the Minister of Police and the next administration to prioritize? And also looking at maybe the role that the Civilian Secretariat for Police Service can play, you know, in policy development as well. I know I'm, I'm putting a lot of questions in one basket, but um, just in the interest of time. Uh, thank, thanks, uh, Lizette. I, I think just to to um, add something on what uh, Gareth has uh, spoken about, the the constitution says that the minister should create. Um, uh, it's it's a forum that it's a it's a committee that includes um, the provincial executives and uh, the the minister, which we call uh, MinMEC. I think for me, um, that should actually even be extended down to local government, wherein the MECs um, of uh, community safety, they also have that kind of structure with the MMCs responsible for safety at local government because they've got a major role to play. Crime happens at a local government. So, so extending that, it will make that coordination uh, more um, um, uh, effective. Priorities for the for the the the, the minister, I think um, the South African Police Service um, Act is outdated. It should be uh, finalized um, uh, the first six months of the the new uh, the the new administration, new parliament, because it's it's still referring to issues of the 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 transitional constitution. I can't remember the interim constitution that we 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 had because it was approved before the new constitution. 
the the issues of uh, critical infrastructure they we have passed uh, the bill it has been signed into law the critical infrastructure protection um, uh, act and they say a, a a concept critical infrastructure protection concept which has been appointed but hasn't been i don't know what it has done since it has been appointed and uh, the time uh, it's time it's it's coming to an end because i think it must be there for 3 months and our critical infrastructure is being uh, uh, ravaged. And this is affecting our um, uh, economy tremendously. So that's another priority that the minister needs to, to, to put in his um, uh, basket. And I must say, I, I've been told that the, the issue of the forensic um, service that problem has been resolved, which means that issues about gender violence and unable to trace um, uh, uh, murderers and um, uh, violent criminals will be uh, resolved. Um, and, and we have to, 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 to uh, applaud the, the minister and the police that they actually managed to focus on that. It means that if there is will, then things do happen um, uh, effectively, and we can take from that and make sure that all the other issues are addressed um, uh, effectively. Thank you. That is um, really good news. I, I, I know what a headache that has been for the courts, um, the backlog in DNA and, and forensics. Um, so just the last couple of questions from me before I hand over to the floor and uh, or to the audience online, and I'm already seeing great questions in the chat. Um, Gareth, a really difficult question, I think. Um, do you think that SAPs have been ag adequately held accountable by our various ministers of police? Uh, have there been notable differences in this regard in your view looking back over the past 30 years thanks is it um i think that they could going back to the way i explained executive oversight i think that approach hasn't been fully understood and adopted and as uh alvin was saying in the beginning you know when the new when the new ministers of police are appointed they immediately the, the first port of call are the top generals and they're going to start getting a lot of information about all the amazing things the South African Police Service are doing because it's a large organization and there are good things to point to. So they're going to say we're doing this. And, you know, it's not like people aren't being arrested. Our jails are full. So they will, their initial response will be, oh, this is, this is where I want to be. This is the kind of area that's more exciting. Um, and I think that often the issues of policy and strategic direction do, do kind of fall by the wayside. There's this idea that, you know, the managers are doing their thing. Um, and also, it's a very high-profile position. So as a politician, it gives you incredible national reach. Uh, you can move all around the country. There's always going to be uh, communities that will be welcoming to speak to you. Um, so I think they get very close to the police very quickly. Um, and there's been some changes to this. I think um, we, you know, we've still, seen some ministers focus on new legislation and white papers. Others have seemingly taken the, the Secretariat of Police a lot more seriously than others. But there have been these differences. But I think in, in most cases, it's been very difficult for the Minister of Police to really hold the police accountable for the kinds of issues I was raising beforehand. Um, you know, we've seen about eight different ministers. We've had a similar number of different national commissioners. Sometimes they get into conflict with each other. And that's also because of the Constitution saying that the president appoints the National Commission of Police and the minister gives directions to the national commissioner. So that person's always got two bosses. They've got the person who appointed them and then they've got the minister who's giving them directions. And that can sometimes lead uh, to some kind of conflict. And we've seen that in the past as well. Um, and so you tend to find personalities getting in, in the way of overall organizational dynamics. And I think that's the big challenge. Um, it's such a big organization that it's easy for ministers to get caught in the weeds, to start getting into the personalities getting into the operations that are taking place, getting to who's being arrested, how many arrests, what takedowns are happening, um, and not sort of stepping back and saying, well, how do we really 
ensure that this organization is operating effectively. And a, and a good example is this decline in the murder detection rate. So in 2012, the police were able to solve or detect 31% of the murders. Last year, it's dropped to 12%. Now that situation, if you look at it, it's been in every year, the ability of the police to solve murders has declined. The detective numbers have re remained relatively stable. They lost about a thousand detectives over that period, but it's still, it's not uh, as bad as say invisible policing where you've seen quite a big drops in, in numbers. But the management systems and structures in place haven't been able to identify that as something that is critical and then change it. It's just continued for 12 years. And so for me, that's, that's sort of indicative of, a, of, 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 of the minister getting caught into the organizational dynamics, not stepping back and saying, well, why is this happening? What is it about the managerial structure and systems that prevents us from maintaining that 31%? Um, and I want to answers about this. And if you can't solve this, because it might be a very difficult, complex problem to solve, it's not easy for busy police commanders to get their heads around, then I'm going to bring in extra capacity to the civilian secretary to others to help look at this uh, and, and come to a conclusion. And the same thing, I mean, it's wonderful to hear that forensics has taken a place, but again, you know, how did it get into such a bad state in the first place? So what is it about the, the managerial um, or leadership structures and systems that fail to pick up these emerging challenges quickly and then make sure they get addressed within a year or two so that we don't see these long-term uh, deteriorations of certain capabilities? And I think that's something that, um, that a minister, if they were focusing at the level, could have better organizational accountability um, than probably what we've seen in the past. But I'd be very happy to hear what others have to say about this. Thanks. And Irvin, of course, um, my next question was going to be to you, but I think, um, do you want to just respond to what you've been hearing from our other panelists? Yeah, yes, yes. I, I, I think that if you were to ask me about three priorities uh, in the immediate short term, I would do three things. Uh, well, if uh, there, there were a new minister, I'd place a moratorium on firearm applications. The state of the Central Firearms Registry is in a complete mess. Parliament has spoken out on this. Uh, a six-month moratorium, clear up the backlog, and then digitize applications um, for uh, new firearm licenses. A lot of our crime in our country is firearm-related crime. Uh, secondly, we don't need to really employ new police officers. I think the new minister's role should be to look to enrolling the private security industry to work more closely with uh, SAPs. And there, there could be something in there for SAPs to use technologies of the private security sector and um, through uh, working very, very closely with the private security sector. At the moment, it's uneven and combined. And then I want to, to uh, as the minister proposed that, the model of community policing be revisited. I think community policing forums has outlived its usefulness. I think we need new structures in place uh, for communities of all, all kinds to be able to engage uh, um, professionally with the police uh, to look at, at policing priorities. So uh, I, I do want to say that that would be for me the priorities of, of, of a new minister uh, bringing uh, the, the, the the public oversight facilities closer uh, to, to 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 the police, and then consulting police officers because they do have experience on, on the ground, and it's as if we as a society have shunned the police officers doing what uh, Anthony Albuquerque calls the dirty work of democracy. Uh, so uh, the, those are some of the issues that I would want to say, and then on the issue of accountability, I think that. We have to strengthen the, the oversight function of parliament, uh, in particular, that uh, those portfolio and select committees in parliament to have oversight over the police and the responsiveness of the department of the police to parliament. For instance, you cannot expect the, um, there to be proper oversight if the crime statistics are released by the minister and parliament is given one hour uh, to comment on it. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. With a budget of 112 billion rand, you need a, a week to look at that budget, whether in fact it's been spent properly and whether in fact it's uh, a bit proper value for money. And then the, the, the oversight uh, parliament cannot instruct the department what to do, but it certainly can make recommendations 
to the Minister of Police and to the President uh, because Parliament has oversight over the executive. And I think that must be strengthened on, on um, as far as Parliament is concerned. So uh, I, I just want to leave that there. Uh, and this thing, the last thing, is you also have to get Parliament to help with the morale of the police um, and the mental wellness of police officers. It's a huge problem at the moment because police officers uh, in some communities are extremely violent. They really don't know what to do. Thanks. Thanks, Irvin. Yeah, I think you have covered what I was about to ask you quite well, because I think the role of parliament um, is going to be very important going forward. Um, and for the new um, administration, we'll see new parliamentarians, potentially parties that haven't ha held seats before in parliament. And I think it's a really important time for for the citizenry and 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 civil society and and government to really make sure that there are some key messages that reach um our new parliamentarians the new portfolio committees as well as um yeah um the people in these new parties that will make up um the part and of course all parties we we you know they will still probably be the majority. Um, but Alvin, uh, before I hand over to the online audience for question or open the floor, can I um, ask you if you have any concluding thoughts of what has been said by uh, up till now in terms of you started off with the priorities um, for a new minister. Is there anything you think we have missed or you know, that would be key to the success of the next administration. Um, I think just to, to underscore that um, when the new minister comes, whether it's this one or the, or the, the new, new one, um, the first point of call is to meet with the civilian secretary, with the secretary of police. And the same applies to the to the MECs of safety. First point of call, you get briefed by the, the, the head of the Department of Community Safety and the Provincial um, uh, Secretariat. And it should be the, the, the Secretary of Police that must introduce the minister. When they go to the, he goes to the parade, the Secretary of Police should be the one that introduce. And you will have a better understanding of um, the, the state of policing if the briefing comes from there. Once you start with the national commissioner and the provincial commissioners, you will have a distorted view of the state of um, uh, policing. And it will mean that you, you will be uh, putting down fires and the police will be taking you from this place to this place to this place before you know it, it's a uh, midterm and uh, nothing has been done in terms of making people uh, uh, safe in this country. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I'll now, op now open to the online audience. Just remember again that Chatham House rules do not apply as this event is broadcast on Facebook. So please do not mention anything you don't feel comfortable with making it into the public domain or media. Um, please use the raised hand function or chat to ask questions. Please introduce yourself by name and surname and your affiliation um, before you comment or ask a question. We will take several rounds, time permitting, at least we still have about 35 minutes left. Um, so I'll do about rounds of three, but I will just start with the, with the comments we have been receiving um, and then um, hand over to some hands. Uh, also remember that there will be an online poll. We would really appreciate it if you can complete that poll. So our first question is, um, questions are from Hans Bueller from the Hans Sadl Foundation, who is asking um, 
to please, um, what are the three major priorities that should be included in this new uh, police um, act? And what should be the mechanism for cooperation between national and subnational law enforcement? How should it be organized? So that's quite a question. Um, Alvin, you've mentioned that quite a bit in terms of the subnational local law enforcement agencies. And then, um, Barbara, I see your hand. So I am going for now just to ask the other questions, if you don't mind. Um, Bill Dixon is saying Irvin took us back to 1993 and made an important point about the minister and the police supporting communities in facing up to crime and violence. Aren't we in danger of conflating policing or the provision of safety and security as, as the title of the first post-1994 police minister's title had it, with the police? Um, or with what the police can or should do. Shouldn't we start with desired outcomes and then work back from how they can be achieved and by whom? So that is, a, I think, a really important question. Um, what priorities should be um, undertaken by so-called policing and what should be in the mandate of safety and security? And then lastly for this round, um, Gregory Brietzke from uh, University of Pretoria is asking, given that there are currently over 11 and a half thousand registered private security businesses across the country, employing over 2.5 million security officers, nearly, well, I would argue 10 times the size of SAPS if your figures are correct there, um, Greg. Um, as are you saying um, SAPS and the South African Defence Force combined, will there be a SAPS in the next 20 years time? So I see the hands, um, just hang on, let's go to um, Irvin, then Alvin, then Gareth. Okay, can I start with that last question from Greg? Um, hi Greg, it's great to see that, you, that you're here. Um, that's an important question. Will we be a SAPS in 20 years' time? And I mean, all the literature is telling us that the public police no longer has the monopoly on the use of force and coercion because we are seeing the fundamental growth of other auspices of policing and particularly in the private security sector. So I think this is the way to go. Uh, there has to be um, linkages with the private and public sector. And we have to think about this in a way that um, doesn't create further problems. Uh, I think, yes, um, uh, it's plausible that we can, um, and this is a thinking space. And so we have to think about how this could be, be made possible um, without uh, diluting the mandate uh, of, of the public police and, uh, and private police. Um, and Bill Dixon, yes, I think we are in danger if we don't address it correctly, in my view, um, because, yes, I think we do have to start with the, with the desired outcome. We want to make our community safer, safer and we don't want the country to slide into lawlessness um, where police officers kill 18 people at a time and think it's OK. Um, and so and we have to make sure that the vigilantes don't control and soon if we're not careful, a situation like uh, Haiti could emerge and Jamaica could emerge where gang leaders and drug dealers take over whole communities and govern it. So yes, I think you, you're you right. I, I will leave the others uh, for other people. Thanks. Alvin? Um, I, I'll just deal with the the question raised by um, Barbara regarding the crime wardens in um, in 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 how um, the the role of uh, the minister of police the the issue of crime wardens because they are peace officers 
Um, it falls under the Criminal Procedure uh, Act, and it's the responsibility of the, the Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development. The Minister of Police has no role there, but the National Commissioner has got a role to play when it comes to the issue of um, if they are going to use uh, firearms that they are properly uh, trained and there's proper certificate that has been given, that's how the, 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 the National Commissioner gets um, uh, involved. But otherwise, it's a, it's a Criminal Procedure Act um, a matter where you appoint um, uh, peace officers. Thanks. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, Zetia. Yeah, I think I'll just start with Bill Dixon because I, in a maybe a clumsy way, I was trying to say the same thing. Um, that that you're right. Community safety requires different role players doing different things at different levels. Um, it's not just a police function, but of course, the police are the supposed to have the you know legitimate use of force, the state's legitimate use of force, in order to ensure that it is the only armed guy in town, only armed sheriff, and you don't have multiple armed groups running around as we see it in Haiti and other places. Um, and so that, to that question, you know, that issue, it is, if you're spoke, focusing then onto the police, um, I don't think we're going to not have the police. What's, but I think we do need to find a way of ensuring that the public police have mm -hmm. a way of coordinating and overseeing all these other groups. Um, and I would be quite hesitant into promoting the creation of a whole range of other potential armed groups that are operated or managed by different spheres of government, different departments, um, without some clear control over or oversight by public interest structures. It's parliament, the police, whoever it is, because um, you do run the risk. And particularly if you start seeing polarization in the country, we're a very diverse country. Some provinces um, could use this to create their own vigilante movements. And of course, those can then be hijacked. And that's also the problem with the private sector. It's not, um, you know, the private sector plays an important role. And of course, they, 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 we must find ways of how to better coordinate all these resources, expertise and technology. And a lot of police officers have gone into the private sector. How do you bring that capability um, to bear? And there are some good, there's a good ears to eyes initiative that's happening at the moment with they are coordinating well. So that's good. But remember, private security companies, um, you know, they're there to provide safety to their clients. They're not a public safety agency. And so the reality is, unfortunate as this might be, if crime starts going down and people start feeling much safer, they will lose clients. They will start having to you know, retrench people. And so there's a, a, a fundamentally different philosophy at play in that. Um, so it's not one or the other. It's about trying to make sure that you get the best out of both worlds. Um, and then to the first question from Hans about one of the priorities in the new SAPS Act. I mean, that is something that we'd have to give a lot more attention to. But I think we would be um, flagging issues around providing some process for directives from the minister so that that to protect police, operational police officers from inappropriate political interference. We'd also like to see the um, Act talk about how the national commissioner and provincial commissioners are appointed, that there is a very clear, um, in fact, all SMS managers are appointed. We would like to see an amendment to the structure that allows, or the section that allows the National Commissioner to appoint people into the SAPS without necessarily having them vet, uh, not vetted, but assessed. Um, so there is a, a, a way, and this has happened before, I, I think I recall what we saw from um, in 2017, and then SAP's acting National Commissioner is now facing two separate criminal trials for corruption, made 80 appointments 55 of these were to the senior management structure without assessing their ability to fulfill the functions that post he appointed them into because the act allowed him to do that. And then you get a problem, and we saw this again in Prime Intelligence under Richard Bluley, over 200 people being appointed without having the necessary skills and ability, that that's actually prohibited in the act, that it's not possible for anyone in the South African Police Service, especially now, even the National Commissioner, to appoint you into a post unless you've been formally assessed against the requirements inherent in that post. And this is not rocket science. This is not radical thinking. This is how all of us usually get our jobs. If you apply for a job, there's job descriptions. Can you meet and fulfill those job descriptions? And that has been a serious weakness in the South African Police Service for many years. Um, so we would like to see that amend, uh, amended. And really to get that leadership structure as coherent, as um, trusted as possible. Um, and we can then uh, move into other areas. But I'll just stop there and let other questions emerge. Thank you.
Thanks, Gareth. So I'm going to hand over to the hands before I go back to the online chat. You see the poll there. Um, please complete it. We appreciate your feedback to do this, to hope to do this better. Um, if you think we're not perfect at this, that's all good. And um, I see the ch online chat participants, Henny, Nicolette and others. I'll get to you after the hands. So let's start with Barbara and then Adip. Barbara, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And um, how amazing to see Owen and Alvin, both of whom I haven't seen, I think, since for a very, very long time. But really interesting conversation. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to ask a question about the issue of partnership with private security. Um, aside from the, the interest for your own clients versus the interest for the public, I think that there is a there's another issue, and that is that the private sector has a profit motive. And so the private sector has a vested interest in maintaining a level of fear in South Africa, and sometimes boosting that level of fear, um, because that way they make more sales. I mean, I know that in the community where I live, we have the most ridiculous private security measures, absolutely bizarre, um, at the enormous expense of people within our community. I think we need to be unbelievably careful. We also work a lot with municipalities and we see them being encouraged constantly to spend money on private security technology that's never going to deliver safety. Similarly with the Gauteng Premier who has told us he's going to install so many cameras that we will all complain about invasion of privacy. He shouldn't be allowed to do that. And that comes from private sector telling him that that is his best solution. I think, Irvin, that you're right about the trauma. I think that someone like the Premier and many people who spend so much money on private security and technology are deeply traumatized by their inability to find a better solution. And of course, the solution isn't just in policing, as Gareth has said. So I'd really like to know your thoughts about, about um, the risks of dealing with private security in that way. Thank you. Thanks. Irvin, before you take that, let's just hear Deep's question. Hi, Adip. Hello. Um, hello, Irvin. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity. All right. So in Ghana, um, we have a Minister of Interior um, with over, oversight responsibility over a number of institutions, including the Ghana Police Service, Immigration, um, uh, national disaster, narcotics, and a whole lot, okay? And when you look at our laws, um, which is found in the last constitution of Ghana, the 1992, there's so much civilian oversight over state security agencies because of our checkered history of coups. So we wouldn't want to give so much power to security services that would, in the end, enable them to take over power from civilians, okay? However, it has also come with its downsides. There's so much political impunity. Um, during police recruitment, there's what we call in Ghana protocol rec recruitment, in which children of politicians, um, constituents of par uh, parliamentary members, um, chiefs, all have a list. And 90% of those um, recruited into the police service should have had recommendation from a politician or a chief or someone powerful in society. OK, so it has created a lot of problems for us. However, to put it into context, my question is quite simple. Do we encourage more civilian control over the police or we just allow the professionals to do their thing, being mindful of the fact that we don't have to make them too powerful? Thank you. Thanks, Adip. I think you are raising very important um questions and, and the context there from Ghana. Um, and I think there's a lot, you know, that we can learn from context on the continent as well. So I'll hand over, Irvin, starting with you, and then Alvin and then Gareth. Yes, uh, thank you um, uh, for that question. Barbara, it's nice seeing you. 
Uh, I don't think there's a Chinese wall between um, thinking about enrolling the private security sector uh, to work with the public police, as, as Gareth has uh, um, uh, suggested, that you don't see it control uh, through a public institution. Uh, one area where you can enroll them is at the policy level. Uh, let's take ICT um, and the paucity on um, uh, the new um, uh, crime networks that have emerged on the dark net and um, where you have electronic crime and a lot of the crime uh, going forward is going to become electronic. SAPs at the mo moment do not have capacity, in, in my view, to deal with all of the, the problems when it, when it comes to electronic crime. And so I think you can enroll security experts in the ICT sector. And how you do this is you give them policing powers when they register as security companies uh, for one day a month. And one day of a month, they must give uh, as a public service to the police, to the public police. And you manage that uh, relationship. And it's hard to think about, but it's plausible because uh, the National Crime Agency in the UK does this. They recruit the best um, uh, uh, technical specialists uh, ICT technical specialist, and they give one day a week, and of course, there's not disclosure agreements that that has to be signed, because the private sector, you're right, uh, protects their clients and work for their clients, but there's no reason why you cannot ask the private sector to provide a public service uh, as part of the um, support to to public safety nationally. So that would be my short answer. I think there must be a lot more discussion on it uh, because it's not that cut and dried. I think we have to go quite a long way. And uh, I think, yes, the, uh, in the response to, to Ruben Klopper's question as well, they do have uh, uh, paying clients, but there is a way that we can draw on the expertise of the private sector without necessarily uh, having the private sector take over the intrusive nature of surveillance, uh, for instance. So let me leave it there and see what the responses are. <laughs> Thanks, Alvin. Oh, thank, thanks, Lizette. Um, I, I think we must also acknowledge that um, the security industry is, um, is also regulated uh, mm -hmm. under the CIRA Act. And the Minister of Police, it's, it's actually responsible for administering that um, uh, legislation, um, which the, the minister can use that power to deal with the issue of um, uh, the, the, the powers of the, the private uh, security industries um, using the, that um, uh, institution. Uh, there is um, a new legislation um, which um, uh, the Private Security uh, Amendment Act, which it's, um, it has been passed, but it's waiting for regulation. Some of the issues, the concerns that are there, it actually addresses that um, issues of um, the, the, the private security companies um, actually um, doing intelligence work that they are not supposed to do. It's addressed in that um, and um, um, uh, making sure that um, they, they, they are doing the work to support uh, the fight uh, against crime, not uh, support their profit mot motive. There's also the issue about the, the ownership, um, uh, which is a contested issue that ownership of uh, the, the private security companies. Uh, it could be 51% uh, South Africans who, who own the, the, the private security companies because there's a number of them that uh, the ownership um, uh, uh, resides with the foreign um, uh, nation. And that legislation is going to, to address that. So they, there is a balance. And um, uh, with the development of those regulations, I think uh, it can address some of the challenges that have been um, uh, raised. The, so. the issue of the civilian control, and I think Nicolette also speak about it there in 
uh, in a note. Do you want me to address that or should we wait for her to raise her um, hand? And... Yes, I'm going to take the next round of chat questions, starting with Henny and then uh, Nicolette, so we can park that. Just want to hand over to Gareth for some final comments on this. Thanks, Suzette. Yeah, look, the issue of private security and relationships with the state and cooperation is, is a huge area because the private security sector is not one thing. It's thousands of different organizations um, that's registered. And we also know that there are many that are not registered. We also know, for example, that, um, you know, criminal syndicates register private security companies in order to get access to firearms. Um, and so as much as you've got corruption in the police, where the police are losing over 700 firearms a year, you've got corruption in the private sector as well. So it's it's about managing risk. And it's about, and I think I, I, I like urban, it's, you know, where, where is the state lagging behind and when can it bring in the private security? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the banks, for example, have been dealing with issues of cybersecurity for, for decades already. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are new emerging areas where the private sector generally, because of profit motive, will be far ahead of the state. They're much more, they're smaller companies, maybe internationally networked, and they're able to move quicker. So how do you bring that in? And it might be that you you actually pay for that to come in. So then you've got control over it. You don't, you're not being unduly influenced. But if, as long as there's transparency and accountability. Um, and I agree, it could also be something that there's a social, you know, responsibility element to mm -hmm. big private companies that want to say, well, look, we will, we will volunteer um, certain expertise and capacity in order to help the state that benefits all of us. And then they use that to market themselves, showing that they're not just only interested in their clients, but overall interest of everybody. So there's various models and ways to deal with it. And um, it's not a, there's not a single blueprint, like there's no single blueprint for police reform, but um, it is a discussion we need to have. But I do think that not just private security, we do need to find a way of having much greater and more meaningful partnerships between the police and various sectors where value add could come in. The police do seem to have this idea that they must do everything and be in control of everything. And that's it's not possible given the complexity of the challenges we face, firstly, and second of all, that we, there is a vast expertise in our society that should be drawn on. So um, I'll end there for, for in relation to that question. Thanks, Gareth. Yes. And I think there's some interesting research in here in this, because I also know um, of private security, uh, smaller companies that have done a lot for social cohesion in their areas that do take the interest or, or work beyond just their clients to to serve the interests of pedestrians and commuters in the area and and really do um take their role in a community quite seriously in a um quite a, a transparent way but moving on henny um Prinsler on the chat and i don't know where you're from henny but you've yeah you're opening pandora's box with this question should the minister be a politician with policing background or a politician with a corporate background with the capacity to put together or orchestrate a board of so-called directors to get the job done? Uh, I think we have had some examples in the past. Irvin, do you want to kick us off? Yes, um, I think in the past you had somebody like Maya Khan, um, the CEO of the South African breweries that was appointed to assist um, the SAPs thinking through the transformational issues. My, my response to any directly, it, it shouldn't matter. What, you, what should matter is at the operational level, um, the individual that um, becomes the commissioner, the man or woman, um, should be the person together with the team. And uh, it doesn't matter who you place there, that individual must have policing experience as the operation commander of the police. At a ministerial level, I, I would say that it, it really doesn't matter if that person is, comes from an engineering background because the constitution and the police act should guide his or her um, frameworks for engaging the police and making policy. I think it would be better if such a person comes from a policymaking um, a background. Policing in itself, I think we must leave that to, to the professionals and the operational commander must be the national commissioner. Uh, it would make um, a, a great deal of sense for the next minister of police to have a strong policy background. Um, and I think there was good value in the issues that uh, Nicoletta's raised because 
we don't have similar problems in the defense force where the budget of the of the police of the defense force is managed by the secretary of defense and um i think the police are doing what they're doing because really they can they've got so much money 112 billion they can do whatever they want to and so we must be careful because policing budgets internationally it's a black hole if it's not if there's not proper accountability measures as gareth and um and others have, have written about and so you have to make sure that there's a strong policy slant to whoever is going to be appointed as the next so that they understand the policy role as a minister of police Thank thanks Evan. before i hand over to the others i think let's just um First, also, I'm just going to rush through the questions. Nicolette has been very patient with us. Um, Nicolette van Sa Saal from Parliament. And she is saying, linking to the comments uh, by Mr. Rapia, the wording of the Constitution establishing the Defence Civilian Secretariat, uh, Secretariat of Police um, uh, and, and the Police Civilian Secretariat is exactly the same. Sorry, oh, the Defence of civilian um, secretaries in the police one is exactly the same. How did it come about that the two structures were established in such a different way uh, in that the Secretariat for Defense is the accounting officer for the DOD, um, uh, thus above the chief of the SANDF, as opposed to the civilian secretary um, for, uh, sorry, the secretary for police and the national commissioner of police where uh, we know the commission uh, yeah, is the accounting officer. Civilian control is vital in both SAPs and the SANDF. Can the panelists shed some light on why there was such a different approach in the civilians control in the secretary, uh, security services? So Evan, you've, you, you've started mentioning that, but Alvin, I think you've got some um, comments on this. And thanks, thanks, uh, Lizette. Um, I, I think uh, we 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 indicated that uh, the South African Police Service Act it was promulgated and became law in 1995, and that was before the the new constitution. And in that legislation, it also talks about uh, the the role of uh, the uh, secretary for police service. Uh, and if uh, I, I stand to be corrected, I think the Defense Act came after the Constitution was um, was passed, and the amendment of uh, the the Subs Act hasn't happened. But in 2011, then the the Civilian uh, Secretariat Police Act uh, was um, uh, passed into law, and. I think the drafters of the, the legislation and uh, because of the, the power, because as I indicated, the police were also responsible for developing their, the legislation for the civilian secretariat for, for police, which is supposed to be their oversight. So that role, there is conflict already when you are developing that and they wanted to secure they are the, the 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 resources that they have, and I mean it took uh, from 2011 up to around 2020 for the civilian secretariat to even have a budget of its of its own. Um, the 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 police was getting the money and they would transfer it to the to the police secretariat. The white paper on policing. Um, also comes out with the structure in terms of how the civilian secretariat must operate as the Department of Defense, and um, uh, even having some of the it it will still leave some uh, responsibility for the for the national commissioner because the defense uh, model is not necessarily perfect. There are weaknesses in terms of that because. Uh, the national commissioner can go and just spend, spend, spend without due regard for accounting because they don't have to account. 
So it, it, it brings in some responsibility to the civilian secretariat, the white paper on policing. And it's an area that uh, we can start in, in terms of transforming the, 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 the status quo. I think and that was the, 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 the reason why they, they are structured differently. But uh, we have got the new law now, and uh, I think um, it can be improved in line with the recommendation on the white paper on policing. Thank you. Um, can I ask Gareth and Irvin just to hold your thoughts? Going to take the last three questions. There's a lot of um, great um, chat points that everybody can read. But I'm just going to take the last three questions, um, then give each of you, starting with Gareth, an opportunity to respond. The first is from John Medice that is asking, what needs to change to enable public and third sector services in South Africa to maximize or establish um, and sustain intelligence-led business processes that identify the root causes of community safety issues in order to prevent them from occurring? This is quite a complex question. Um, uh, Gareth, I don't know if you feel, um, uh, I don't know if I even understand it, um, but maybe John would like to explain. And then he's also asking what needs what need to change to enable services in South Africa to provide visible and constructive accountability around community safety issues that engages and involve a diversity of the population in the decision that affect them? Yes, good question. And then from Ezekiel, um, should we just go with have a, having a professional police as our minister instead of just going with the politicians. Like someone like Mkwanazi, I assume the provincial commission of KZN has proven that if we have a professional police as a head of police, we can deal with crime decisively. This is Ezekiel Kirikana from the island. Susman Foundation. Ezekiel, I hope I've interpreted your question correctly. Um, Gareth, I don't know if I've done justice to John's question or questions. Do you want to have a have a go? Thanks, Lizette. Uh, you know, these are very complex issues, so we're not going to mm -hmm. give um, clear answers right now. Um, but I think what we've been saying um, here tonight, or well, sorry, today, today, this afternoon, this morning, um, is trying to grapple with the answers to these questions. What needs to change? How do we ensure that we get the best out of our public sector? How do we ensure that we get the best out of the other sectors that can play a role? And we focused on what the minister can do, given that post or you know that position is incredibly powerful in South Africa because of the constitution, um, the profile. And so I think what we're doing today is to try to think through what advice would we give to the minister of the next administration, whether it's the same minister or a new minister? Um, what could be done differently using that power in a way that could possibly unlock some of the challenges, promote better accountability, engage communities better, and other potential partners uh, to solve some of these complex challenges? And that's, I think, the main purpose of today. I hope to some extent we've managed to provide some thought-provoking insights into this and some potential answers. Um, yeah, but I, I suppose there's just no simple answer. There's no blueprint we can take from another country and put into South Africa. We have to muddle along on our own. But I think we have the people in this country. We have the expertise in the police, in the private sector, in civil society, in academia, to solve these problems. It was certainly to do a lot better in solving them than we have to date. And I think that's our, our main objective of, of today is how do we get the best out of all our sectors uh, to make the biggest difference. Thanks, Gareth. Irvin, your final words and responses to these questions? I I um, want to come to this question of uh, Ezekiel, of a professional minister. Um, I'm not sure that that in itself will work. It's at the operational level that we need to have professionals. Um, the I don't necessarily agree that... Um, Okonazi has been um, successful in KZN because of the amount of political killings in KZN. Um, 
And for me, as a panel, I would suggest that we have to keep the police's paws out of policymaking. That should be a civilian function. And the, therefore, the civilian secretariat on police should be strengthened uh, rapidly. And I think I see some great names in this in this uh, in the seminar. I see people like David Bruce and Krikler. I see. I mean, these are, are are people that have thought about these problems. Um, I see John Berger here, uh, and uh, we have great people in this panel. And I want to suggest that the way we change things in in, in the country is to think about it differently. Um, and there's no reason why we can't bring people together in a, in a, in, in a more de decisive way to think about the policing challenges. It's 30 years since uh, our, uh, our, our first democratic elections. And maybe it's time that we pause and, and think about this in a more sustained fashion. And I think I want to thank you, Lizette and, and Gareth and, and Alvin, for this uh, fantastic seminar because there's a lot in here for researchers, as you say, but uh, taking the issues of the country forward uh, can't be, be solved in, in, uh, in, in a one and a half hours or so. And I think maybe it's time for that next uh, uh, community crime prevention conference with academics. And it's time that SAPS allows civil society back into the partnership. Thank you. Thanks, Alvin. And your final words, Alvin. Uh, oh, sorry, I just want to... Oh, yeah. uh, Alvin and Ivan, they are very close. Eh? Mm. <laughs> now, I just want to 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 thank thank you for inviting me to this um, uh, engagement, and um, I think it shows that we care about uh, this country and we want to see uh, change, and it can only happen if all of us are working together criticizing constructively, of course, as we have done in this uh, engagement. And we hope that those who are in power will take uh, our inputs as in this discussion seriously. Even if they just take one thought and go and implement it, it might make uh, a huge difference. Thanks. Thank you, Alvin, and thank you to, to all three of you and to the participants online. Um, we can always have more time or we want more time, but I see we are over time. I, I think this is um, not an event that just ends now. It is what you have said, what you've written in the chat, we will compile, we will take forward to um, other events in our Driving Justice series. I think our net, next event is around the 27th of June after the elections when we are seeing what the outcomes are for Parliament and, and, and who potentially by then we have a new cabinet and a new minister. I look forward to, to continuing this engagement with you. And uh, we are, as always, very grateful for the support of the Hans Seidel Foundation and the members of the ISS Partnership Forum. Um, without further ado, have a great afternoon and a good, hopefully peaceful election. Thank you, everyone.